Oh my goodness. Straight from down under, I just sat down with Dr. Jess Michaels. Oh my goodness, the creator of the birth sling. Do you guys know Jess? Do you know about this birth sling? I mean, I only found out about Jess and the birth sling about a year ago. And that's just scrolling through Instagram and following birth workers and like came upon it. And so I reached out to Jess and I was like, I need to know all of the things. I need to know about your birth. I need to know about this birth sling. I need to know how to get this birth sling so I can incorporate it into my doula practice. I mean, Today, we sat down and we chatted about all of it. And our birth story, oh, it's on point. Home birth, 42 plus weeks, midwifery care, a water birth in the pool, saline injections. There's so much that we hit. Like there's so many learning lessons. This is a great episode. And she's offering 20% off the birth sling to all birth story podcast listeners with code birth story at the birth sling.com. So push pause, go check out the birth sling.com or on Instagram, the dot birth dot sling and leave it a review. Let us know what you think about the birth sling. This episode, oh my goodness, it's goosebumpy. It's everything. You're going to love it. Okay, let's get to it. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does a day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hides. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. So like, let's say you're pregnant. That's why you're listening to the birth story podcast and you're preparing for a hospital birth that's upcoming. And of course, this podcast gives you tons of free information, right? But like, do you really understand the stages of labor? How to know when you're in labor? What if you have to have an induction? What about a cesarean section? What about all of the decisions that you have to make once you get to the hospital? So you get there and then they put you in triage. Birth Story Academy walks you through all the things that happen, like that rapid fire with like monitoring and blood work and questions and IV ports and do you want an epidural? I don't know. Do you? In Birth Story Academy, we literally break down all of those decisions, pros, cons, risks, benefits, intuition, and like we get into it. We make birth plans, we do birth visions, we listen to birth affirmations and parenting affirmations. And like at the end of it, like you know exactly what's going to happen when you go into labor and when you get to the hospital. What's gonna happen after you give birth? Newborn care preferences, how to take care of your baby. I guess what I'm getting at is if you're not in Birth Story Academy, what's your plan? I want you to come join me in Birth Story Academy and let me walk you through all of the decisions that you have to make if you're having a hospital birth and how to have body autonomy and how to have informed consent and informed refusal. I'm going to teach you and your partner, if you have one, everything that you need to know about birthing in a hospital so that you can walk in that door with some swagger, with some confidence, wash that anxiety away because you learned everything you needed to learn and Birth Story Academy, and you are ready to crush that birth. Okay, let's do it. And let's get to this episode. Hey, Jess, welcome to the Birth Story Podcast. 
Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, welcome. We hear your accent, but please let everyone know where you are coming from. I'm coming in from down under, (laughs) from (laughs) Australia, from Coffs Harbour. I am so excited to have you here today, Jess. Jess also goes by Dr. Jess Michaels, and she is the creator of the very popular Birth Sling. Now, some of you guys right now are like, pause, hold on. What is a birth sling? We're going to get all into it. And we're going to talk about Jess's birthing experience and the creation of the birth sling and how it can affect and impact your birth, everybody, and why you should buy one. Um, So I'm really excited, Jess, to dig in. Let's start at the very beginning, because I know that the creation of the birth sling and your birth were kind of like intimately tied together. So like, That's right. yeah, let's just go back to like getting pregnant. <laughs> so <laughs> was that, you know, spontaneous fertility <sighs> kind of what did that look like? Oh, it was very spontaneous. <laughs> um, so my part, my current partner and I. We had actually both hadn't been together that long, to be honest. (laughs) We'd come out of long-term relationships and, you know, met and was having a really lovely time. And I think it was probably like four, maybe five months in. And, yeah, we were on our first road trip together down to the ski fields um, down south and, yeah, found out, I think, after three days of snowboarding, (laughs) that I was pregnant and yeah first time I'd ever been pregnant I had had some um, fertility challenges in my previous relationship so it was it had come at a really big surprise but yeah it kind of felt like the universe's way of being like right well this is your next journey and yeah it was exciting though a bit of a shock (laughs) Such a shock. You know, I have a doula client that's coming to mind and she and her boyfriend had recently started dating and they were like, we really like each other. Like, and COVID just hit. So they're like, let's just travel across the country, like in an RV and like camp and like get to know each other. They got to like their like first major stop and she found out she was pregnant (laughs) and they, I think they continued on for like a few more months, but then ended up having to come back. So um, sometimes the spontaneous makes the best story. Yeah. I'm pretty sure my partner was like, well, you know, if we can like go to the snow in a in a van, <laughs> she's pretty cool. And then yeah, um, yeah, then we found out we we're pregnant. <laughs> I was gonna say, so what led to the pregnancy test? Were you on that? Were you snowboarding and like I'm about to die? I'm so tired. Or like, what made you want to take a test? You know, there'd been an an incident where I was like, oh, that could have been a bit close. Where, you know, and then it just kind of. I remember sort of planning for the for the trip and being like, oh, I'm going to get my period, damn it. And, you know, being a camper van and, yep. um, yeah, and I didn't, I kept not getting it. <laughs> and then, like, the night, I kind of was avoiding it a little bit and we were just having a great time. And, yeah, after we had a talk about it, actually, I was like, look, I think I'm, I think I'm late and, he was really sweet and just like, well, you know, let's, we've got a bottle of champagne. Let's do the test and drink it regardless. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm not drinking champagne. If I'm just mad at <laughs> um, so I think we had some champagne and then I did the test the next day. <laughs> yeah, oh, what um, a good celebration. I love it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So how old were you? I was 34. 34. That sounds right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Younger than me. I think I started at I was 36 and 37. And so anytime anyone has a baby and I feel like when I had kids, I feel like I felt like I was really young at the time. So I'm always like when people are like 22, I'm like, really? I'm like, man, 
I was having a lot of fun at 22, but 34 <laughs> is a great age. I think that's a great time to have a baby. And the reason that I'm asking you about that is because I'm wondering, like, I know that the birth sling is very important to the birth workers and is such an important product. But I was sort of wondering, like, what was your career prior to that? I'm an osteopath. Okay. And yeah, I had always had a special interest in working with pregnancy and postpartum and babies. So, you know, and I'd say that I'm building my online presence now, but prior to being online, I've worked quietly in the background, like one-on-one with women um, for quite a few years. And that has always been my absolute passion and Yeah, I think until though I went through the journey of pregnancy and becoming a mother myself, it was difficult for me to really make that my thing. Um, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome, even though, you know, I'd done all the study and was continuing to do all of the study around um, pregnancy, birth and postpartum. It was just hard for me. Yeah, and having faced some fertility challenges, it was a bit of a a bit of a slam in the face, like going through that and then yeah, not having been through that journey myself. So until I came out of mat leave, I just kind of didn't make that what I advertised for, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, it so, absolutely yeah. makes sense. I mean, I'm over here as an entrepreneur. Uh, with the with the podcast and I have a book and I have an online course and I was a doula for 18 years but this surprises everyone that for 14 uh, well I've been a doula for 18 years but for 14 of those 18 years I never left my day job until Mm. four years ago I just felt those same feelings Jess like I was like No, I mean, there's so many better podcasts and so many better books and you know what I mean? And it's just like, who am I to be the expert? And I feel that very deeply and every day is still challenging. I mean, our businesses are still relatively infants, you know, Mm -hmm. um, in the online world. And so it's important that we get together and we encourage each other like this and we promote each other's businesses. So, um, it helps. Now I know what an osteopath is, but a lot of the Mm -hmm. listeners are like, what's that? And how, what does that have to do with pregnancy and babies? So could you share a little bit, because we have lots of osteopaths all over and I do Mm -hmm. recommend, um, well, in here in the U S we call it a DO like doctor of osteopathic medicine. And so, um, I do encourage my clients to see DOs and chiropractors and acupuncturists and functional medicine providers. And so I'm just was wondering if you'd share a little bit about your osteopath career. For sure. So I think it's important to say, I believe there's quite a difference between an os- like being a DO in the States and being an osteopath in Australia. Okay. Um, I'm, I believe in the States they have prescription rights and they're a little bit more almost like a medical doctor, whereas here in Australia we're very much um, body workers, you know, so those are the original principles of um, working with the body's innate healing capacity to yeah, like to find health and well-being. Um, and so I know that there are osteopaths in the States that still use the manual therapy side of things, but I know that they also maybe have come a little bit more in line with tradi- like with the mainstream medicine. Um, but so here in Australia, yeah, we, we work with the body. So it's um, you do, you know, like a full medical history and that kind of thing to really get an understanding of where a person's at and then work with the body to find ease. And um, it's a really holistic practice, you know, mm-hmm. um, and particularly to do with like pregnancy and um, getting ready for birth and then also like postpartum. There's lots we can do to just help a woman's body be ready for birth. So I never like to tell women that, yeah, I can do natural induction and and that kind of thing, because 
I think the the baby and the um the mother's body know when the right time is, but um there's lots we can do just to help yeah, the body be ready for that time and yeah, make it a smoother transition from maiden to mother, pretty much. Yeah, I think that's so beautifully said. I have a mum right now that's waiting on her birthing time. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard when she's 41 and a half weeks. And so she's having a few signs, but, you know, she probably will go 42 weeks or over. And we just, she had a membrane sweep today. And I just had to remind her, you know, that's an incur, it's an induction method. And it's, it's an encouragement but it's not definitely going to put you into labor. You know, Mm -hmm. we had to share all these things I talk about on the podcast. Even uh, we can encourage the body to do what it knows how to do, but it's stubborn sometimes and it's going to do what it wants to do in its own time. That's it. And, (laughs) and I always, you know, I, when working with clients, I do hesitate, like if they discuss like, membrane sweeps or stretch and sweeps or um you know if it's going to stress the woman out that's just counterproductive you know and Mm -hmm. I'm like just try to I use the word surrender a lot like let's just surrender to the baby's timing and yeah like to that your body knows like there's such an innate knowing inside of you that it knows when the time is right and yeah we can certainly do lots of lovely relaxing techniques to help you feel relaxed and ready and get the pelvis mobile and moving and um but yeah try not to stress out about due dates and those kinds of things that's absolutely true I birthed at 43 weeks with my first and people find it quite surprising that when undisturbed and untouched that women have reported going all the way to 44 45 and 46 weeks gestation and people are saying oh no that's not possible and I'm like yes and it's on record you know Mm -hmm. Um, It's just that we have these averages. When, and I'm going to go forward and then go backwards, what gestation were you when you went into your birthing time? Yeah, it was just, um, I was like, oh, I should have like double checked and clarified. But I know that I was over 42. I had a lot of, I I feel like my labor was about a week long. So I get a little confused on how far exactly I am. I I went, but it was like 42 and four days or something like that Yeah, by the time she was actually here. Yeah. Well, we had yeah. very similar stories then because my labor was almost a week long also, yeah. five days. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it was several days of that like prodromal, very exhausting yeah. labor that just stays at 10 minutes apart, seven yeah. minutes apart. And you're like, come on already. Mm -hmm. Um, so Jess, you were already in the birth world when you became pregnant and like did this for a living. But I know from those that I've interviewed, sometimes the experts make the worst (laughs) patients. And so who was taking care of you and your body while you were taking care of others in their bodies? Well, we were really, really lucky we had the most beautiful um, unregistered midwife, actually. So technically, I don't even know if I can use that word midwife. Um, but yeah, she wasn't part of the hospital system or anything like that. Um, yes, and- you can is the answer, Jess. Right? Yeah. <laughs> midwifery is an ancient practice that has been passed down and just like doula work and birth work and just because we slap certifications on professions that are callings doesn't degrade what we are taught from being witnesses and watchers and the things that we learn from our mentors and our peers that still make us just as valuable yeah. without a title yeah that's so fair. as a shout yeah. out to your midwife <laughs> yeah yeah she's awesome um yeah so was really lucky you know early pregnancy a couple of people were like oh you've got to use so-and-so and yeah so we were planning a home birth mm-hmm. and um having you know I think it's funny 
I remember sort of we found out we were pregnant and obviously my partner and I hadn't really had any of those conversations about like, oh, what would, you know, how do you feel about this style of care? And yeah, he's um, from Venezuela and I remember him being like, oh, you know, like in my country, like some, some women just like hang off trees and give birth that way, like, you know, like bear, bear down on the tree branch. And I was like, okay, I think we're going to be cool. Like he seems (laughs) really comfortable with the sort of home birth, holistic um, style of care. So he wasn't worried at all about natural birth. So that was good. (laughs) And wasn't afraid to see you in your power and your primal state. Yeah. He was like, oh, I actually really hope the midwife doesn't get there in time and, like, I can catch the baby and stuff. (laughs) I know. She definitely had lots of time to arrive, though. A whole week, it sounds like. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that. Like, the the period of time when someone (laughs) puts a date on the calendar and they put a circle around it. Under midwifery care, like, did they do that with a home birth or were they like, we think that you're due around this time period and they gave you a range? You know, I had chosen this particular midwife. You know, I went to the GP and got a blood test to confirm um, to confirm the pregnancy. And I did a scan at like the 12 week scan and um so they gave me a due date based on the size and that kind of thing which was the 4th of May or May the 4th and we kept joking that it's a Star Wars baby (laughs) um but my midwife was really just like due dates so you know guest dates and like baby will come when baby's ready and really cat like just super calm and yeah, absolutely no pressure whatsoever about um, when baby needed, you know, was going to arrive. So that was great. It was, there was no pressure on me whatsoever with regards to due date. Did that translate to you? Like, did you feel like that you then were free to not feel stress around oh, 40? I was so and not stressed. Okay. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. Okay. I was actually, I was probably like, oh, please don't cut, like, around the 38, 39, 40, like I was very much, oh, I hope the baby doesn't come yet. You know, like I just have a few more things that I want to get ready. And and then for sure, the the only things that um, probably were starting to get a little bit annoying was everyone, a few family members and stuff like, oh, what do you mean? Like, why isn't the baby here yet? And all the text messages and calls. And I know it all comes from a place of love and that kind of thing. But yeah, it was just like, okay, it's fine. Baby will come when baby's ready. But definitely no pressure from my care provider at all. (laughs) So The, The excitement and the good intentions of the people that love us and are excited for these little souls to enter into the world. But it it does feel like pressure sometimes. My doula clients are are instructed that when they hire, because they hire me so early as their doula, they're instructed to go back to their family after their next appointment. And then they're to say, they changed my guest state. And I have them at eight eight days. So I would have said, okay, now that you're going to go home, Jess, and you're going to tell everyone you're actually due May the 12th. And yeah, so like exactly. it takes, you get at least eight days, you know, but the pressure um, to be off a little bit. Um, yeah. So as a body worker and mm-hmm. really a birth worker and preparing those for their birth, when you looked at like the books on the market and the birth tools as you were preparing, because now for a home birth, you have to buy things and rent <laughs> things, yeah. right? So tell me, tell the audience some of the things that you were adding to your home as your birth tools. You know, obviously our midwife like drops off the birth pool from about 37 weeks. And I remember her sort of casually making a joke like, oh, don't blow it up too early. But, you know, wanted to like be prepared. And it's this like white elephant in the room for quite a while. (laughs) Um, But, you know, so had the standard sort of list of like towels and all the sort of things like that. But um, for me personally, 
and a good friend of mine who I who's also an osteo and we um we studied together and she I'd asked her to be at the birth as well I remember us like well actually I'm not sure if we were chatting about it but I had created something like that I could just throw over a door just from some things that I had laying around at home that I could pull down on you know I really I don't know just intuitively had this sense that I wanted to bear down on that I would want to stretch or bear down or pull down on something so yeah I got something like that organized actually my partner also because we were renting at the time as well he bought just without even talking to me and I was like oh that's really sweet this like you know you can get those chin-up bars that hook under a door he bought one of those as well which we didn't end up using but he thought I could maybe hang off that at some point as well and yeah but aside from that you know all the standard sort of things like the birth ball and lots of pillows and all the nesting kind of things like making sure it felt nice and pretty and fairy lights and all of those (laughs) sorts of things. And it really Um, is like a nest, like it really is a birth nest. Um, Totally. People beforehand, I'm thinking, you guys, if you have this big house, don't worry about it. You're going to be in one small little area with with small movements, (laughs) small, gentle sways and movements and you know, I'm like, you're not going to be in your kitchen and your living room and your stairs and your bedroom. I <laughs> just well, in in saying that, I think because it went on for so long for for me, it was good to have like, I did kind of change rooms and have different. I don't stations. know what the right word is, but yeah, stations, stations. exactly, <laughs> like different stations to kind of go to, like a workout. Yeah, so yeah. good. Um, Yeah, and looking back at the footage of our birth, um, which we just kind of did ourselves, you know, there was, you know, oh, we're in the bedroom, oh, we're in the leaning on the kitchen bench, and then we're back in the pool, and you know, yeah, yeah, so. Oh, that's good then, because I find in my home birth clients, they just set up one little part of the house, usually in their living room or in their like master bedroom, like the big or the biggest bedroom that there is in the house and just kind of stay in one, you know, one little nook or one little area. But when you are in labor for a week... (laughs) You're, you know, <laughs> yeah. I I joke that I did most of my labor on the disc golf course. Do they have that in Australia? <laughs> disc golfing on the. Oh, it's no, uh, like fris- sure um, They may call it frisbee golf, and other okay. countries. Do you have that in Australia? No. Okay. It's not sure. It's essentially all right. Well, (laughs) everyone in Australia who's listening to this podcast episode, there are they'll take large pieces of land, almost like a golf course, but instead of like a hole in the ground, there's like a basket above. And you start at like the T and then you throw the Frisbee and then you run to it and then you throw the Frisbee and then you run to it and then you throw the Frisbee into the basket. It's quite a great workout, but I really enjoy it because it's beautiful scenery. And so I did most of my laboring, walking the disc golf courses with my partner while they played (laughs) disc golf. Oh, nice. And the dogs were just running free. But you need, if it's going to go on a week, we need lots of, you do need lots of different stations and circuits, I will say, to mentally get you know, get through that time. Um, there- yeah. Well, those, those first like three nights, well, the, the prodromal labor for me was mostly at nighttime. Mm-hmm. And so then we'd wake up and it would fizzle out and it was really beautiful time, like May. So still kind of warm here. And we were just at the beach all the time. Like, you know, my partner was just getting in luck. La- oh, this, this could be the last surf for a while. So yeah. he'd go for a surf <laughs> and yeah, I, and I would have mild contractions on the beach and yeah. <laughs> yeah. And those ocean waves, they'll pull them right out of you. Right. Yeah. Just, I mean, really the, the elements, right? Like we're recording this in the middle of hurricane Ian mm. and the barometric pressure change that just happened today with the storms. And I'm like, Oh, we have, 
you know, like I said, there was the one who had maybe the sweep today, who's may go tonight or a few more days, <laughs> but there's a couple other ones that I'm waiting on, um, that I think the barometric pressure to change from the elements could really pull the baby's lower today. You know? so Heidi abruptly ends the call to go. Yeah. The- <laughs> yes. yes. Um, but I do, you know, I remember that um, feeling of the things being the last things, you know, when you get into those yeah. 41st, 42nd week, especially thinking, you know, maybe this is for me, it was the last sleep. Is this the last sleep? Yeah. I'm going Yay. to get type of thing. It sounds like you were handling your prodromal labor beautifully in your preparation. And I led with that question about the tools because ultimately this experience led to the creation of the birth sling. Mm-hmm. So tell me about when you went into your birthing time, active labor. So you were in your prodromal labor for many days, but how did you really know to say, to, to say to yourself and to say to your partner, okay, this is now my active labor. I think it was like the third, I'd had three nights where it had all fizzled out, but on that third day, like I think around lunchtime, during the day and we we're out at the beach and my mum was had actually come back from a little camper trailer trip um so she was around as well I just remember that um and I was starting to get contractions at the beach like more rhythmically and like oh actually this is happening during the daylight and um yeah my partner was out surfing and I was in the back of my mum's van sort of like on the bed, like, oh, I can, you know, starting to feel these. And so we all kind of um, agreed that, you know, we should go home and just sort of this could be the start of it now and um, just try and get some rest. And so mum, bless her, like we had agreed that she wasn't going to be at the birth um, because, you know, I just think home birth, she like love it a bit but we just agreed that it was best that she wasn't there (laughs) and um so my friend Julian and yeah my partner we all went home and from memory there it just started to kind of continue my friend gave me a little massage and everyone was just kind of relaxing and the contractions just started to get more stronger and more rhythmical and yeah, we went throughout the night that night and and we were timing them, you know, on the on a contraction timer to just kind of see um where they where they landed and the contraction timer kept being like, Okay, it's time to go to the hospital and obviously we weren't <laughs> going to the hospital. Um and we we would just check in with the med- midwife through text message. She had actually been at another birth. That's something that I um sometimes forget, which you know, maybe that's why my prodromal labor went on for so long. It was a little bit like the, me and this other mama that she was caring for kind of started at the same time, mm-hmm. but it was her second baby. So she was like, look, I'm just going to go and attend to to this woman. And I'm like, oh, of course, of course my midwife has another, <laughs> another, um, you know, another birth, but yeah, it all timing wise, it all landed really well. And, um, you know, we text her in the middle of the night and she's like, oh, it sounds, sounds like you're in active labor. Like we'll, we'll probably head out there in the morning. Um, so yeah. And it just kept going from there and, and didn't stop. So yeah. Yeah. now you had all these tools, right? You had these stations and the, the birth <laughs> tub and you were thinking before labor began that you might want to hang on things. But when you actually went into your um, birthing time, what did feel good? How did you comfort yourself through the waves of the contractions? Yeah. I remember um, our midwife like texting Ali, my partner, sort of being like, "Oh, you know, tell her maybe just to run a bath. Like, don't fill up the birth pool yet. Like, but um, so water was definitely very soothing for me, um, and I spent a lot of time in the water. In hindsight. I think it probably potentially dragged the labor out, you know, and obviously like hindsight's a great thing, but 
I uh, did did spend a lot of time in the birth pool and, you know, gravity can't really help you help the the strength of your contractions and that kind of thing when you are in the water. But that's where I felt comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and first time mom, I kind of was just looking for that comfort and, you know, for to soothe things. Um, so I spent a lot of time like that, but it was definitely in and out. And when our midwife arrived, like early morning, um, I think that was like Monday morning, I was in the pool at that stage. And, you know, after a little while of her just like quietly, I wouldn't have even known really, but assessing like if it was active labor and at some stage I came out and we would just move around and I would put my legs up on on a stool and you know do all the different kind of intuitive positions and yeah spent time like hanging off the of this contraption that I had (laughs) designed off the door um sort of in a squatting sort of position rocking my hips from side to side and and yeah it just kept going from there for quite some time were you ever afraid uh Afraid is probably not the word that I would use. Um, no, I was never, I always felt really, no, I was never worried about the baby. I was never worried about my health or, or whatever. Um, there were times, you know, after a couple of days where I was just like, what is happening? Like it was that that feeling of, you know, not being in control or, or not understanding where we were at and wanting to like make sense of it like why why does it not feel like anything has changed even though for sure the intensity was building the whole time um it it, you know I can see that now but I remember hearing the kookaburras which are a native Australian bird here which they call at dawn and dusk and I remember being in the pool and hearing the kookaburras for the second time and being like, that's not another morning, is it? You know, and um, just kind of feeling a bit defeated because every day you're like, okay, yeah, it's what is, what's the day? It's the 18th. Yeah, this is a nice day to have a baby. And then like the day would change again. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So the, some of the words that I heard were like, um, uncertain, lack of control, defeating feelings. The reason I bring that up when I'm interviewing people, Jess, I think it's so important to share about how just labor itself teaches you and how labor itself changes you. Like it Mm -hmm. forces us to be comfortable at some point we have to be comfortable with the lack of control yeah can you identify in your labor when you just let go and just gave in to the birth the laboring yeah for me the the big lesson in my birth and I remember um I'm not sure if you know of Jane Hardwick Collins who is an amazing ex-midwife here in Australia, a really wise woman. I remember her saying I did one of her um, retreats when I was early pregnancy and she's like, you get the birth that you need, you know, and I did some work sort of unfolding the messages or the the lessons for me in in our birth. And, um, you know, there came a point where I needed more support and I needed to let go for me personally like it was really hard to ask to transfer and I did I did early on I think it was on the 18th in the morning and then I got out of the pool and there was some blood and some change and it was kind of like a positive sign and I ended up I was like oh no okay things are changing like I can stay and I can do it and I stayed and labored for another like six or seven hours but then it just got to a point where I was tired. I'd been vomiting a lot and was now struggling to even take in water um, without feeling nauseous and felt dehydrated. And as much as I was 
I was afraid to transfer because I felt like that meant C-section just because of all the stories, because of my birth, you know, and all the transfer stories that I had uh, heard and, and whatnot. Like I it just felt like that was what was going to happen. Um, and so that was a huge lesson for me just to surrender. And, um, yeah, we, we decided to transfer to the hospital around like 9, like 9 p.m. on the 18th. And, yeah. After many days of prodromal labor and after a long period of active labor. Now, Jess, I know you're an osteopath and you're a body worker, and I'm over here listening to your story as a doula. And the things that come immediately forward for me are just the position of the baby, (laughs) Right. Like, (laughs) you know, when they're um, working, the baby's working really hard with you to try to internally rotate and navigate the pelvis. I'll see these prolonged um, labor experiences with unique labor patterns and lots of prodromal labor. So, I mean, I don't know if... um, your child was uniquely positioned when you were at home that was, you know, making the labor so long, but I would guess. Mm -hmm. Was your midwife able to transfer with you? Yeah. Yep. So she came in her car behind us. Okay. Um, And yeah, it was something that we'd questioned, you know, whether she had a hand up by her face or that kind of thing. There's, you know, I, I'm, I was a professional dancer for years and I was still teaching ballet like while I was pregnant for a little while, like just as a, an additional side job and I horse ride. So there was all this kind of like, Oh, you know, that kind of body type, it may just take time. And, and yeah, again, our midwife was just like, birth takes time sometimes. And she was never concerned or worried, but, um, I do feel like the transfer to the hospital was like one of the best things for for me and my body because, you know, I had to get out of that comfort of the pool. I had to move around. It like helped my pelvis move. I had to lean over the car, the capsule in the car, and then the walk into the hospital. All of those things were probably really, really good for, um, yeah, for baby's position. So, yeah. It's, it's interesting. (laughs) Time after time after time, I'm laboring with birthing persons, just, just like you. And I'll say, let's do, we really need to do some lunging. Okay. And we need, we need to get out of the tub and we need to do some deep squats Mm -hmm. or, you know, a full, full yoga flow. And they just look at me like, (laughs) no. And yeah. so it's really hard. So we call, well, here, we, me and Colin in our practice and some other local doulas all over, they call the water the aquadural instead mm. of the epidural. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, both the aquadural and the epidural, in my experience, make you comfortable and also make the labor slow down if used mm-hmm. for too long. <laughs> or too early or too early in the labor. So yes, getting out of that tub and moving and walking and lunging and gravity um, can can help. Yeah. I was just going to say like, you know, because I work as a doula as well and attend births and it's like, there's always this fine line of the mother knows, she knows the position she needs and she'll intuitively go into positions or wherever she wants to be and that will be what's best for her but I 100% agree with you like sometimes just that gentle suggestion of hey would you like to get out and do a little bit of movement and and our midwife is so like she's with women she trusts and really trusts in the process though Upon reflection, I remember sort of thinking like, I probably could have just used someone a little bit more, like I, I, it would have been helpful for me to just have someone to be like, Hey, do you want to just do a few laps around the house or something? You know, I just needed that little bit more 
I remember sort of being in the pool and thinking, like, I do find it hard to ask for help. <laughs> it's one of my lovely traits. And um, yeah, I remember having moments of, I probably could have been like, just tell me what to do, but I wouldn't say that, you know, I, I don't know. That yeah. was definitely something in me, <laughs> a lesson. And that's actually a key question as a doula that I ask upon like the intake forms. Yes. I like, I ask my clients to talk to me about their personality type Mm -hmm. and their Enneagram and their love language and how they, how they process discomfort and when they're Mm -hmm. sick, how they ask or don't ask for help because I do find it helps the people that are around you to like motivate you (laughs) when you're in labor to maybe move things with the the mindset of your midwife there is that lives in all of us doulas right Mm -hmm. the like with woman believing in the body and think you can lay in this tub the baby will eventually come you know but If you want to encourage this to help work with the baby, you know, sometimes where I'm like, let's just for a few minutes, get out of the tub and do some lunch. And I say, we'll get back in. (laughs) She probably did, you know, like, man, the three days of active labor. But um, you probably told her no, Jess. Probably. Get away. No. no. You said no. Um, So there you are at the hospital and your midwife's able to come with you. Was your friend able to come too? So because we had um, my friend and then the midwife like brought a doula as well as another set of hands. Um, Gosh, she did all more than just hands, like lovely, (laughs) you know. uh, All the doula things. Yeah, exactly. Um, Only our midwife came. So um, it was during COVID. It wasn't, we weren't in one of the like strict, harsh lockdowns. And I don't think we'd gone through, yeah, like there was no actual policy yet. Um, So, but we just thought, oh, just bringing one person and my partner obviously was probably, um, yeah, better. But my friend stayed at home and cleaned the whole house for us. And yeah, she was amazing. I know. I mean, how nurturing. That must have felt really good to have received that support. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So once at the the hospital, were you like, I'm so tired, I need to get some nitrous oxide or an epidural, or were you still like, I want to keep doing this completely unmedicated? I went there very much with the intention to get fluids. Like I wanted just a IV drip of you know, mm-hmm. saline, um, because I felt dehydrated okay. and I did want some pain relief. I was having really intense back labor. I vomited so much that I'd strained a rib. And so with every, every contraction, I was also getting really high pain up in one of my rib, uh, attachments. <laughs> and, um, so ding, so ding, did, ding, you guys, yeah. I've got to tell the audience this, right? Like I wasn't even at your birth. I've never even heard this story, but I mm-hmm. already mm-hmm. called it of your baby's position and you just mm-hmm. confirmed it with me yeah. when you said back labor. So this baby was su- a transverse or OP. We know by the way your labor pattern was presenting and the way you were feeling the back labor. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. It was, yeah, all, yeah. you know, and the only position toward like the latter part was just, I just needed to be on my hands and knees. Mm-hmm. You, know, you look back at footage and my hands and knees were red, raw, like, like rough, rough. worn down from like the birthing pool and from all the positions. But yeah, so I went to the hospital with the intention of some sort of pain relief mm-hmm. at that point. You know, I was probably just like, whatever, really. Um, But at the same time, I remember being very staunch and like when they gave me the drip, I was like, there's no antibiotics in this. There's no oxytocin, like syntocin in this. Is there, you know, really still like wanting to be um, mindful of what they did. Uh, But yeah, so they really wanted to check baby's position first. And we knew that she was head down, 
they wanted to confirm it. I can't remember if they, and I remember they brought the ultrasound machine in, but I don't feel like they ever got to it. They were talking about maybe a catheter, but that never happened. And yeah, they, they got me on my back at one point to try and just do a quick check. And it was very obvious that baby's head was right there sort of thing. Um, and at one point, I just remember my partner being like, um, because, you know, it got really busy. The room, there was lots of people. They were really lovely. There was, it was interesting, actually. It was a male midwife that sort of was on, in charge, I suppose. Um, And I remember sort of like looking at him and looking down at the name badge being like, who is this? Is this an obstetrician? Is this like, what are you? And he was the clinical midwifery advisor um and he was lovely he was so look I've worked in home birth scenarios I'm really supportive of your transfer and just want you to know that you're still in charge here and there's too many people in the room like you you know you're you just let us know and we'll ask them to so that was really nice and really I can't you know I've I've thought about it several times like who was that I I need to find out who his name was because it was really nice this is magical I mean I love hearing stories like this That they were so like affirming of your choices and wanting to like honor what that must have meant for you to have been at home and transferred. I mean, how beautiful. And to receive that for me on a personal note from a man, like that receiving help from a male, you know, in this situation, it was really healing for a lot of, you know, I, I was fearful to go to the hospital and. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. So he was really lovely. At one point I remember my partner being like, all right, like we came here to get her some pain relief and nothing's happened yet. Like he could obviously just see me like in all the positions, like just getting all the checks and stuff struggling. And so then this lovely male midwife, um, was like, right, well, why don't we try some sterile water injection? And in my head, I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm pretty sure I know what, like, and it's like, yep, it's just water, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that can't affect babies, they're all water and blah, blah, blah. Like, so why don't we try that first? Um, And yeah, see how you go with that. And that just felt like such a relief for me, because although, had he have offered epidural I probably would have gone yes like I was just so exhausted and so tired at that point and yeah I'd had all those feelings of who am I to have any judgments on what women you know I was just like I was done at that point almost and Mm -hmm. the sterile water injections were such a welcomed offering (laughs) that it was like oh I can still save this <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they can be quite effective for back yeah. for back labor. And you guys mm-hmm. listening, everyone right now is like, "What in the world is a sterile water injection?" Is exactly what you think it is. It is like saline, yeah. essentially, like going into your like into your back in little injections. Do yeah, you, just under the skin. <laughs> yeah. Do you know about how many injections they did? Yep. So it was the, they have two practitioners at the same time, give like one needle each, and then again, another needle each. So four injections at the same time, just, you know, down near your, close to your sacrum, a little bit higher than your sacrum. And um, they sting like, my goodness, like nothing else. And, you know, I remember screaming like crazy. But um, then I had a contraction and I remember the the male midwife being like, how does that feel? Could you feel that in your back? And I was like, I'm not sure, you know, I was a bit out of it. And then the next one came and I was like, oh, my goodness, like this is so different. I can, it was like everything changed. And, yeah, I, I could feel what I imagined it should have felt like, you know, not in my back, not going up my back. And it was all sort of down lower now so yeah that was amazing and then he sort of said all right like well shall we run the bath and um they ran the the bath for me and I got back in the bath and at this point 
So he disappeared on his white horse. I'm not sure where he (laughs) went. And I was left with female midwife from the hospital and our midwife was still there. Okay. And I got back in the in the pool and um, continued to labor and everything just felt so different. It was amazing. And, you know, my sounds um, changed and you could really tell that, you know, she dropped down and I was about to birth my baby. We did have a moment where the obstetrician came around just to kind of like check in and um, – she, we had, we didn't tell the hospital how long I had actually been in labor. So I think we told them it was like 24 hours as opposed to like the 40 something hours that it had already been. And yeah, so the, the obstetrician came by and I was in the pool making all the sounds and she suggested that I get out for them to check if I had a cervical lip. Which, you know, in that, like, I was on another planet by this point and I kind of remember coming out and being like, oh, okay. And my midwife who was sitting there in the room was like, Jess, if if you get out of the pool and check, like, you're going to have this baby on the bed. And I was kind of like, oh, yeah. And she was like, well, we're really worried that you have cervical. I was like, well, I'll check. It's fine. Like, I'll feel. And I did, and I had a feel, and you know, I'd kind of been feeling throughout the labor a few times, and I was like, she's right there, I can feel her head, and maybe there was like, you know, a little bit of a spongy lip feeling, and I kind of, I don't know, I just kind of moved things around a little bit, pushed it away, yep, (laughs) yeah, like, and it felt fine. I was like, no, it's all good, and. She kept insisting and it really took my partner to be like, look, come back in an hour and the baby will be here. And she was like, all right, and left the room. And I I don't know how much time passed after that, but it was, you know, not, didn't feel that long. And yeah, my partner got in the pool and everything just felt completely different. And then we birthed her and or I birthed her and yeah, yeah it was amazing. So you were <laughs> able to birth her in the hospital in a birth pool with yeah. your midwives. With the so the obstetrician yes. didn't come back for the delivery. She, she didn't come back for the delivery. Um okay. so yeah, in, in Australia, like in, in the hospital system, like if everything is going well and, and naturally, um then Usually they'll have two midwives there from the hospital. Like they'll they'll make sure that there's two midwives when the baby is actually being born. Um, and there's no real, they don't need to call the obstetrician unless it's like an emergency or unless um, something is, you know, not quite going um, to plan or as straightforward as it would normally. Um, so, yeah, the obstetrician left. I think I remember clarifying this recently actually I think the other midwife from the hospital so there would have been my midwife who wasn't actually there working anymore she was holding our camera but she was there supporting us yeah so she wasn't working in the hospital as a midwife um and then they had the midwives from the hospital um yeah doing but they were really respectful like they know our midwife and they know that she works in the community um, unregistered and are usually really, really supportive of her. And so they kind of gave us a little bit extra space, I think, knowing that. I love it. Okay. I have some just logistical questions yep. that I just love because I love a good water birth. Um, yeah. So was your partner like who, who like, I'm going to air quote, caught the baby because yep. we're really just helping the baby to the surface essentially sure. but was that you or the midwife or your partner or who was helping yeah, so I was like leaning forward like holding onto the rail you know onto the bath railings and um I remember you know feeling that crowning like ring of fire and I'm like oh okay. yeah okay and so it birthed her head and I remember saying to my partner and I've seen it on the video like okay get ready to catch her you know because I didn't know 
she might go behind me or whatever. And then so I said that to him. And so he was kind of prepping, like not prepping, I don't know, he was just watching in a, in, in awe probably, like baby's heads out. And um, then, you know, the next contraction built and um, birthed the rest of her body. But the way she kind of came out, I was like, oh, no, no, I've got her, I've got her. And she was just sort of right there between my legs and I lifted her up and, oh, my goodness, she was like the most beautiful thing and just looked straight in my eyes and we just had this moment of locking eyes and, yeah, she she was really calm for a moment and I think I just lent, uh, tilted her over my arm to kind of, I don't know, I, I just sort of felt like I wanted to make sure her airways were clear a little bit, but, yeah, it was just the most beautiful moment. So I caught her yeah. <laughs> in the end. And I love yeah. that that rubbing and that turning her is, it was instinctual for you. Yeah. To, to like, yeah. like our, again, our bodies know exactly what to do. Now in the third stage of labor um, is the delivery of the placenta. So did you stay um, connected to her and in the water for the birth of the placenta? So I stayed in the water for a bit of quite a bit of time like you know and she brought her up to my chest and she had a little suckle and um we had a really nice you know amount of time I'm not sure how much time passed but then someone suggested I think it was the hospital midwife um you know would you like to get out and and come over to the to the bed and by this stage I was like you know just feeling a bit cold and ready to get out and um they offered me we call it syntocin here in Australia I think it's Pitocin, pitocin over there yeah. yeah so they offered that to me if I would like that to birth the placenta I'm like no no way <laughs> I declined the um injection and we went over to the bed and she just stayed connected and yeah then the placenta I think maybe someone suggested like when I just see if like you can bear down that this part's all quite I'm sure it is for most women it always gets a bit fuzzy doesn't it because you're just so like in love with your little baby but um yeah birth the placenta no worries and um yeah what they did a little check to see if there was any tears which I didn't tear at all which was great and yeah she was just in my arms and pretty much didn't let her go until later on that night like my partner was on the the little couch bed thing next to our bed and I decided that I wanted to use the bathroom and go and have a shower and so yeah I got up and was like here hold your daughter (laughs) and um yeah had a little shower and and then she just stayed in my arms for the rest of the night. I slept with her there. I'm not sure if I slept much. I can't remember. But, yeah, and she, we didn't do any sort of, like, weighing or anything like that till the next day. And she was born at, like, one twelve a.m. on the 19th. And, yeah, I think we kind of left the hospital. by we were getting ready to leave by about 10 a.m. the next morning. So, And what did she weigh? 3.7. Um, kilos so that's like eight I can't remember what that is because you would know. use pounds don't you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't 3.75 know. I, I think that was like eight point something I can't remember now not but, yeah. small <laughs> no she was healthy yeah yeah, mm. yeah really healthy oh Jess what a beautiful birth story mm-hmm. thank you so much for sharing it I've got yeah. a quick question it's quite yeah. commonplace in my um, city to encapsulate the placenta and ingest it. Is that common in Australia? Yeah, it is. Um, some people do it. Uh, I decided not to for a few reasons, but we took the placenta home okay. and had it in our freezer for a year until we um, we bought some land, which we're trying to build a little house on at the moment but we on her first birthday we took it to our block of land and buried it under this beautiful tree and um it was so incredible because we kind of like 
you know, it was defrosted and we showed her the umbilical cord and we're like, look, like this is, and then we buried it and she got so emotional and cried and was like, bye-bye, bye-bye. And it was so moving. Like she knew. Ah, she knew. She She felt that. Totally knew. Yeah. I mean, it's their little pillow for so long. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's And she kisses that tree every time we go to the block of land. She's like, oh, Oh. hola, (laughs) Arbol. Oh my gosh, I have goosebumps all over. It's incredible. Well, we have just a few minutes left, Jess. And so I was wanting um, to share now how we heard Jess several times talk about hanging on that cloth and hanging on things. And I was wondering if you would just share a little bit about the birth sling, what it is, and how you developed it based on your experience as a body worker plus your expertise in birthing with your daughter. After the birth of our daughter, our midwife reached out a couple of times like, oh, you know, I was just wondering if um, I could borrow that thing for the, that you made, like for this next woman. And then like, again, for this next woman. And yeah, I remember like going over my birth and thinking, you know, in hindsight, I definitely could have spent more time out of the water and it, it likely would have helped things um, progress quicker, I think. But it, you know, it doesn't matter. And it was the perfect birth for me. Um, but when I started having the midwife reach out about this, I kind of was really putting more thought into it and starting to do more research. And I know there's been some peer reviewed research come out of the States from some birthing centers out of, out there where they've started to use slings and um, hammock style fabric, you know, in birthing centers. And for us, the, the big obstacle was the fact that we were renting, you know, I, didn't want to put any um, fixtures into the ceiling or anything like that. And so the beauty of what I created was that it has this door anchor that just sort of flicks over a door and you click it in and, um, yeah, you can move it around the house if you're home birthing or you can even take it to the hospital and hang it on the back of the hospital, like the bathroom door or something like that. And I played around, um, you know, I was still postpartum, like pretty early postpartum, and I played around with some different designs and was actually really loving the feeling of it, like for my breastfeeding back, you know, like stretching out into. So what I had created for our birth was pretty much just the the, um, the arm straps, you know, to pull down on, whereas what I ended up creating for the birth sling was a big beautiful piece of fabric that you can actually lean into and hang into and it really supports you in different positions and it supports you to stay upright and active for longer so that was definitely a big part of what I felt I learned from my you know from my personal birthing experience and then you know through all of the oh I'm not sure should I should I go for this should I do it and release like a small my first release and doulas especially everywhere were like this is amazing oh my goodness like you know so many birth workers have reached out to me and and you know women that are like I wish I had this for my birth oh my goodness like this would have been perfect and my partner always jokes like you know partners you're gonna want (laughs) this because it's it's hard on them you know we hang off them if we're not hanging off something else and um it's tiring and they're not allowed to complain (laughs) at all during the during the labor um so yeah that's how it eventuated I was a bit nervous to bring it out initially because you know you always have those fear of failing or whatever but it's just been received so well and I think it comes from really authentic, um, like I just want women to feel more supported and to have more, I don't ever say to women like, oh, you need this. Like it, no one needs anything. Like you've got everything that you need inside of you to birth your baby, but it might help make it a smoother transition or yeah, it will support you 
a little bit more throughout the process. And yeah, it feels good. It feels (laughs) so good. So you guys... Colin and I have these birth slings for our practice from Jess, and we are very excited to announce that just last week we had our very first birth using the birth sling, and I was just like so giddy about it. I actually had the couple come over to my house a couple of weeks before the birth, and we like opened it up and looked at the instructions, which it's like the easiest thing in the entire world to use. And it feels so good. And so I actually lent it to her for the end of her pregnancy too. So she was able to just kind of stretch and move and sway. And then I believe she was about the same around, you know, 41 and a half weeks and was able to use it to stay upright. She had quite a long labor with an OP baby. And um, it was still about 36 hours, but she was able to use the birth sling to feel supported and stay upright and have a beautiful vaginal birth. Um, It was wonderful. And so I'm just really thankful that you created this product and you brought it forth. And yes, doulas everywhere are going crazy for it. And if you're a doula and you're listening, you should absolutely buy one. If you are um, preparing for your birth and you just want a way to move your body and be comfortable, you should absolutely buy one. So Jess, thank you because Jess is offering 20% off to all of you listeners with code birth story on the website, which is the birthsling.com. And then I was hoping, Jess, you could share a little bit about your Instagram and how people might connect with you that have questions. Yeah, for sure. So um, on Instagram, I'm at the dot birth dot sling. And yeah, I share lots of, you know, my favorite thing to do is just to show authentic, true um, birth stories of women and how they have come to use the birth sling for their birth. It's always amazing just seeing how differently women intuitively feel to use the sling. And so, yeah, you can reach out to me there. I'm also on Instagram as Dr. Jess Michaels. But, yeah, you can – it's just – it's me behind both accounts. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me there. And I'm always happy to, um, yeah, to help and answer any of your questions. And I promise I'm going to send you some pictures as we continue to use the birth sling with the upcoming births. And maybe we'll highlight some of those stories on the Birth Story podcast as well. So just love them. I am so thankful for your product. I'm so thankful for the birth work that you do and for the work that you do as an osteopath. And thank you for sharing your beautiful birth story today on the podcast. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the birth you want, no matter what that looks like. 